Good morning. What a sea of faces. And you guys are super far away over there. Um, I'm going to do a bad job with eye contact, I'll tell you. But here we are. So um, as Chris said, you know, me and I don't know, 18 jillion people over the last 14 years have been working on a project called First School. And I'm going to talk about that project, but it isn't about the project. It's about who we've worked with and what we've learned and the ways that hopefully it can be applied um, in classrooms for zero through um, uh, kids zero through at least age eight, although we certainly work in our schools now through fifth grade because in our you know, pre-K three is not really what schools tend to look like, and we've been lucky enough to have fourth and fifth grade teachers say, well, hey, how come we're not working with you too? So it's been nice for us. So the bottom line is that no work is gonna get done in any project that we do without developing a culture of collaborative inquiry and a mindset of continuous improvement. Like, you are dead in the water if you don't have a situation where people are really wanting to work together and trust each other. Our big issue, and it is our tagline, is improving the school experiences of um, African American, Latino, and kids who come from less advantaged homes. We came into our project making the decision that we were not gonna be the all children people because we've seen too many projects where the kids were really concerned with get lost in an all children. And it isn't that we don't love and work on all children, but our focus is really on the kids where we continue to have endless, endless achievement gaps and that we really need to do something about it. Really want to talk about what the kinds of data that can help improve practice. Certainly we want to use research. And the main reason, I think particularly for a group of educators, is that you have to be the voice of your kids. And if you're, if you're not working directly with kids and you have to be the voice for your teachers and for also what happens for the kids in whatever, whatever area you're working because you have to advocate, you have to say what's good for kids. And to do that, you have to have the research and data to do it. So collaborative inquiry is really that active process of the actual working together. Um, I think we've moved really far in the field. I don't think it's unheard of. I think you're used to it. But do I think that it's a given that people want to inquire into their practice? They want to spend time thinking about it. They want to be curious about their kids. It's hard because I've, I, I, I've done many of the jobs that you do. I know how exhausting it is. I know the pressures. And so trying to find the time, the energy, and the support to sit down and grapple with the important issues that confront us on a daily basis is hard to do. And so it really is up to the systems in which you work to value that and to help make it happen. It is super hard for you to make that happen on your own. Um, and sort of my favorite notion is really treating schools and classrooms as a place for investigation. It's let's stop doing what we've been doing forever. A lot of it doesn't work. Lots of it does, great, but at least question it, at least look into it, at least say, who does this work for? Who does it not work for? And are we just relegating kids who've been struggling forever to continue struggling because we don't want to change what we're doing. I'll tell you, you're going to listen to me have a lot of opinions here. Um, I do have a lot of opinions. And it's lovely because I don't have any bosses, so nobody can tell me not to do it. So this is what you all want to aspire to, <laughs> is having nobody tell you that you can't say what you want to say. You can also disagree with me. <laughs> so key 
is valuing expertise. We just don't value our educators. We are controlled by so many outer forces and forget how talented and experienced and knowledgeable that teachers and principals and directors are, that who knows the kids best but the ones who spend a billion hours and yet somehow or other that always gets you know, put aside by people who really don't see the kids who are making decisions. So that valuing of teachers is super important. Um, the high expectation um, literature and research for kids, you know, is very strong. We really know the power of high expectations. Everything that I talk about today is parallel process. What's good for kids is what's good for you, and it has to be that way or it's never gonna work. It has to be the same for everyone. So the messages for you as adults and the ones that we want to give to children is that you're smart and you can keep getting smarter. You are a contributor to your family, to your classroom, to your colleagues, that you belong. Big time, you gotta know you belong. That's huge. And again, the high expectations, the high standards. And so you want bottom line for all of you, for all the kids you work with, to be able to believe that they can succeed, that they, their ability is not fixed, it grows with their effort, again, that they belong, and that what I do has value, that you have to feel like the way, whether you're a child, whether you're an adult, the way that you spend your day is valuable and valued. So when we started first school, we were, all of us who do first school, we're all, we've all been teachers, you can't, be part of first school if you haven't been a teacher um, because you have to know the shoes. And we have principals who work with it. We have lots of people who fill lots of shoes because we really need the perspective, the real on the ground knowledge in order to be able to make progress. When we started the project, we had 10 committees of people who did every single part um, of education help us put first school together. Um, although we come out of a university, we were um, absolutely determined not to be ivory tower people. It was like we have to be people who are grounded. And so all our advice came from people who really do the work. And so what, what became obvious, and is something that you all know, is that you can't come in with a project, with a notion that is too overwhelming. All of you are overwhelmed all the time by new curriculum, new initiatives, new projects, new committees, new everything. And that, you know, you're just, you're tired and it's hard to, you know, it's hard to stay eager to continue participating. And so, we decided that we wanted to limit what we were gonna cover to sort of 10 important research ideas and that our goal, and we continue to work at this goal because it's not an easy one, but our goal is to be able not to be that one other thing, but rather to be able to link in and tie in to the other things that are going on in schools. So we looked into the research literature, particularly on kids of color and kids who come from poverty, looking at what are the things that really support, that are really seen as important. And we came up with 10, and they're up here, and um, that we didn't know at that time that they were gonna sort of fall into what we now call our cultures, a culture of caring, a culture of competence, and a culture of excellence. And these are hierarchical 
in that our initial work in schools and probably the longest piece is on that culture of caring that that has to be in place. So just like the importance of collaborative inquiry and growth mindset is this notion that children need to feel deeply cared for has to be established in schools. And, and that's not always so easy. And we really do feel that although these practices, each one of them is valuable, is that it really is a package that kids really need all of these, and we're gonna go into some detail on all of them. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to tell a single person a new piece of news is that you have to have relationships with your kids in order for them to succeed. Um, that especially kids who are coming in from more chaotic lives, from more difficult lives, if they're not feeling safe and secure in your classrooms, in your schools, um, literally on a minute by minute basis, is that the kinds of progress that we hope to make simply are not going to happen. Um, you know, I know that too often I hear, I don't have time for relationships. And really the only answer to that is, you don't have time not to have relationships. So we really want to also particularly focus on strengthening self-efficacy, that kids feel good about who they are as, as Latinos, as um, uh, second language learners, as boys, no matter what, we want them to get a message all the time that who they are is particularly great and that we really help them develop those particular identities. Um, and also the notion of developing the whole child. All of the zero to five people who are in here, that's just normal, that's what you do. It's about making sure you're covering all the developmental domains, and from our point of view also, that you are covering all the content areas that kids are really getting a chance to develop in every single way. So, um, but it's harder when we get into the, um, the K3, K5 space because of the enormous demands of testing, of literacy, of math. So how do, you know, how do we make that happen? So, you know, one of our big questions is, are we reaching these kids? And, you know, their faces tell the story that at such a young age, they have already heard all too frequently the messages that they don't belong and that they are not valued. Um, I am certain that all of you, most of you, have been in classrooms where by the time kids are five or six years old, they're done. They have already heard so much, have had so much negative attention that they think, this is not the place for me. And so these are kids we're particularly thinking about. We come at our work from a dropout prevention frame. Um, we were lucky enough early in first school to get a grant from the North Carolina legislator, legislation who um, they put out a, you know, a, um, a proposal to work on dropout prevention. And of course, who applies for that? Middle school, high school. And so we decided that we were going to apply for it because we look at the research, we look at the data, and it's like, who drops out? Boys of color. And it's like, so let's start super early about changing their minute by minute experiences so that indeed they do know that they're smart and capable. And they actually gave us that grant and we got three years to work with teachers in North Carolina who really, really wanted to be part of that. We worked with pre-K through third grade teachers just focusing on making boys of color experiences better. And, you know, why do we want to do that? Why is this so important? 
And the research is so strong on what happens for kids early sticks. And if kids are having a good experience, they're going to school, they have friends, they feel like their teachers like them, they don't end up in trouble, they're engaged. They are in good shape to keep going and doing well. That, they, that trajectory for them is very solid. Kids who are not having that experience, kids who are in trouble, kids who are turning their cards, who are missing the missing recess, not getting to go to the ice cream party, being threatened to have their grandmothers called, this sort of endless litany of microaggressions, nobody can stand up under that and still believe that they're smart and that they're valuable and that they belong. And so when I ask people to inquire into practices, to think about the effect of some of the decisions we make without looking at what are the real effects on kids, these are some of them. Because those negative perceptions of who you are as a learner are really, really, really hard to change. We also know the literature says that kids need at least two good years in a row when they're young in order to really have a good chance. And we know in all of our schools that we have enormously talented teachers. And we also know that we have teachers who are challenged, who have a harder time. And so I think something that doesn't often get thought about are some patterns that I tend to see is that the super talented teachers end up in first and third grade because you have to learn how to read and you got to take your first set of tests. But that teachers who are having a hard time, and believe me, I am not, I know there are awesome kindergarten and second grade teachers in here, but I also know there's patterns that kids that sometimes are less talented teachers are in K and second grade, and we get this. And so, you know, as we think about the kinds of things we need to think about to ensure success for kids, it's like, how do we make sure that our kids are getting two and we would sure as heck love three good years in a row? So there's three main things, and these are universal needs. So that means you have these needs, I have these needs, and everybody you work with has these needs. You need to be able to connect. You need to be able to connect with your colleagues, with your family, with the kids in your classroom. Your kids need to connect with you. They need to connect with each other. They need to know all the people who work in their schools. They have to feel like they're related. They have to experience success, to feel competent, to feel like a contributor. You all have to feel that too. You can't do this job that you do every day, which is the hardest job. I think most of you are teachers and or at least have been, as was I. And I've done a lot of jobs, but I will tell you that I never did a job that was as hard as being a teacher, ever. It is such a hard job. And that you have to have autonomy which means that you can cause change, that you actually have a voice in making things different in little and large ways. And so these are really the, this is motivation theory, self-determination theory, and it is the three things. And so when things are running amok, whether it's in your classroom, your school, your center, the table you're sitting at, look for these things and say what's not here because it will really, really, really help you make some good decisions about how to change it. As so we think about a culture of care, lots of you know the class data, certainly the zero to five people do. Um, it is a measure that allows you to look at um, emotional support, 
classroom management kinds of issues and uh, instructional support. So this is just the emotional support. And it looks at um, the pre-K is blue, K is red, first grade is green, second grade is purple, and third grade is blue. So these are just scores that we've seen in our projects along the way. And so we are talking about a culture of care and we think about what happens as kids move through their schooling years. And I've talked about this up and down thing. And so kids who are in pre-K, and we certainly know that lots of them aren't, but kids who have those zero to five experiences, they come with a notion of school, a picture of school as a place that's positive for them not very negative, has sensitive teachers, and regards them for who they actually are. And then school changes, and school changes for big reasons, not because kindergarten, first, second, third grade are not, are not peopled by talented and hardworking people, but because the ratios change, because in kindergarten, in particular, and I had one of our speakers today, Juliana, was a kindergarten teacher for 18 years, and you're going to get to hear from her. Um, but that kindergarten teachers get kids who've had no school, kids who've been in care for five years, kids who come from all, you know, like it's the range is huge of like, you know, kids coming in and their ability to all of a sudden, a, a, a adapt to a school setting. So, and then aids disappear, and the curriculum demands are up, and the testing has to start on the third day, and a whole other world. But my job is to think about whose little shoulders that's on, and that's on the shoulders of those five-year-olds as they make that transition. So kids who have this notion of school as a pretty positive place all of a sudden find it less positive, more negative, less sensitive, and with less regard for who they are. And so again, as I've urged you to grapple and talk, it's like, how do you focus on some of those things in the midst of everything else you're focusing on, but how do you do that because our job is to care for the kids. That is the number one job. And so we have to think about these things. Another way of looking as what happens as kids make that pre-K through kindergarten transition, again, on the shoulders of five-year-olds, is that pre-K and kindergarten are very different places. And this comes from the edge of SNAP, and you're going to see data from all of us probably today um, in our different sessions. But the purple in the pre-K is choice time. Kids getting to pick where they're going to go, who they're going to work with, materials they're going to use, how long they're going to stay, which is, you know, tends to be close to half the day in most um, zero to five programs. And all of a sudden, you are in whole group for 52% of the day. So whole group can look a whole lot of different ways. It's not just like, oh, that's terrible. But it can be, I can talk to a teacher about this data, and that teacher can say to me, wow, I know that I have a whole lot of whole group and I really want to be able to have my kids go out and work in centers, and I want to pull small groups because I really need to differentiate their learning. But right now, I don't feel that I've got, you know, that I feel that the kids can be productive when I'm not with them and I don't have an aid, and sometimes parents are in, but I can't count on it, those big realities. But and I'm being the teacher again, I do get them up every 15 minutes for a brain break, and we do a lot of, of think, pair, share. And, you know, so this is, this is a reflective, intentional teacher who says, you know, I'm working on this. And then I can talk to somebody else who will say, 
What my kids need to learn is to sit crisscross applesauce and listen to me talk. And that's a harder conversation, but you start with where people are and you have to find out, you know, right, so who's benefiting, who's not benefiting. I had this discussion actually um, with a teacher last week and I asked her, you know, I said, you know, how is that working for your kids? And I said, what's the percentage of kids that it's working for? And she said 50. And so 50% leaves half of her kids where she's spending half her day doing something that she knows doesn't work. And so it's like, how do you then, you know, follow up with, well, how can that change? Because that is simply can't just be something, and it's January. So it's like, that's been going on for a long time. So we talked about developing the whole child. And again, and I, and I was talking about the content areas. And so we, in pre-K, we know that kids, they get science because anything like head, shoulders, knees, and toes, um, you know, like learning their body parts, um, reading books about giraffes, checking on the weather, um, having a science center, um, that they get to move around a lot. Kids in most centers have an hour of outside time where they really get to move their bodies. And we know that the research says you need an hour of gross motor time. And, you know, it's in the course of 24 hours that kids need an hour of gross motor, but you have to think about who your kids are. So if you're working in places where your kids are gonna go home and they're gonna go to gymnastics and they're gonna go to soccer and they're gonna run around in their backyards, well then that burden of an hour does not fall so firmly on your shoulders. But if you're working in places where kids are in childcare until late, where there's not many opportunities for gross motor, whether they're going home, to places where it's not safe for them to be outside, where they don't have bikes to ride, then what's the decision you make about how to make sure that the oxygen that their brains need shows up in their, you know, that they have that opportunity. You know, so often, you know, we see recess at the end of the day. It's like, don't put recess at the end of the day. Uh, again, I know you guys don't get that choice. People decide when you will have recess. And we talked about advocating for your kids. And it's like, look at the research, bug your people about, you know, like what should happen for kids. So we see, you know, that the, the content area drops off because there's such stress on math and literacy. Um, science all over the nation is the lowest, um, even though we know that kids just are so curious and have such wonder, but teachers often just don't feel like they have the materials, the knowledge in order to do that. Um, music and art, I know we have specials and that kids go off oftentimes and get them other places, but it doesn't tend to show up in the classroom. So in one of my big worries about the, the um, content areas falling off is that there's a ton of vocabulary that's part of all those particular content areas. And if, you know, we, the research on vocabulary tells us that kids who come from less advantaged homes have far less access to academic language and words, again, falling on your shoulders. But when we're not having science, we're not having social studies, then all those words are just not there for them. And, and also just if, you know, again, you're not coming from advantaged homes, you're not traveling, you're not going to museums, you may not even be going to the park, then, you know, the, the burden for school is, is huge. But again, this is the kids. So how do we make sure they get what they need?
If one of the primary goals of public education is to help develop good citizens, why do we teach content but discipline behavior? Um, it's, we see it everywhere where I've never seen a child get in trouble for not knowing his alphabet or not writing a paragraph correctly. Um, we have endless patience for coming up with new ways to teach kids how to do those things. But starting very early on, we have very little patience for wiggling, not being able to stand in line, getting distracted. And you know, I think that we really have to view the entire teaching job for early childhood people as that kids need to learn that. That's what they're telling you. Just like when they can't write their name, you keep practicing. If they can't stand in line, they can't wash their hands without flicking water at somebody, they have trouble cleaning up, then they have to learn how to do it, not be in trouble because they can't. I go back to that notion of being in trouble at such a young age and what that, <clears throat> what that message is for them and how much it hurts them inside when, things, when they're in trouble. Um, so, so often the things that get in the way and cause attention and behavior problems come from the fact that executive function, self-regulation, have not been developed. So I'm betting that most of you in here have gotten access to the brain research, but it is powerful in that self-regulation and executive function develops in the prefrontal cortex. And if you do not develop those areas, you will not learn how to self-regulate or develop executive function. So bottom line is that self-regulation cannot develop when adults regulate behavior. So you think of kids who were, have been in those programs with half the day is in choice. Well, they're learning to negotiate space, materials, relationships, that's their whole job. That's my definition of zero to five. That's what you do. And all of that allows them to start developing self-regulation. And then if you're entering into a situation where <clears throat> you have to sit crisscross applesauce, you have to fold your hands, you have to be quiet, you have to walk with your hands behind your back, you have to have silent lunches, on and on and on, you are not developing self-regulation. And so you're in trouble for not being able to control yourself, but you are not doing the genuine work that it takes to, de to develop that prefrontal cortex. So we think about behavior systems. And I was a special ed teacher, and I was a genius at, um, at oh gosh, token stores and check sheets and awards and you name it. And you know, all of us in our careers, we think about the things we regret. I regret that so much. Because what that does is that it, um, it makes your relationship rely on rewards and punishment instead of on relationships. But I also understand that you can't just tell people, give up your behavior system, that that doesn't work, that people need something to replace it by. And so we work really hard with teachers to think about you know, all the QRIS stuff and the, or not QRIS, um, PBIS stuff. Um, a lot of that is, is aimed at the development of community and being positive and you know, a lot of really good things. But it tends to be that when teachers make decisions or schools make decisions about how they're going to handle management, that they never change them. It's just there. But the goal is to move from that extrinsic motivation to intrinsic. 
So if there's systems going on in your schools, then you have to think about, well, does my class really need them? I have talked a lot of teachers out of it, and um, one of the, you know, in my long relationships with teachers, many people laugh at themselves about giving up control. Uh, we are a controlling group. Um, and so to be able to say, you know what, my kids can handle themselves. But you have to do it in steps. Um, and maybe you can think about whether your classes need it or your school needs it, but also maybe only three kids in the classroom need it. And maybe you could get focused on community stuff and then maybe eventually that, it's, that it is that development of that powerful community. And I've seen so many people do it. So, so um, really wanting, of course, to talk about culturally relevant teaching. And so about 90% of the world operates from a collectivist viewpoint, um, which is really about working together and honoring the group over the individual and interacting with others. Whereas individualism, which is primarily the dominant culture in the United States, is really about independence, being individual, achieving, personal choice, and you know, and, and so it's not a judgment on either one of them, but if we think about the kids who are in our classrooms, and so if they are coming from families who certainly, and communities and churches that convey this notion of, it's really important that we all work together, not so much that I'm the top dog, is that as you enter into classrooms and you're, you sit by yourself and you work by yourself, is that message, quiet or loud, is that we do things differently here at school than you do at home. And so what is the value in thinking of making classrooms more familiar to the kids who come into them? by considering the cultures that they're bringing to them and having that place feel like that. Not all the time, you have to do lots of different things, but that's a, an important thing to think about. And also, who matters? You know, when children show up in your centers, in your schools, in your classrooms, what's the message? What do the, who do they see on the walls um, when they're walking down the hallway? Who, what pictures are in the classroom? Are the pictures, if you have any kind of pictures of diversity in your classroom, are they always cartoon characters? Do you have multi-language books in your classroom? Do you, bottom line, have pictures of the kids and their families? You know, that is just a normal zero to five. You know, everybody has pictures of kids and their families in their zero to five classrooms. And then it almost completely disappears, as if all of a sudden, gee, you're five now. Why would you want to, why would you care if you had a picture of your family in the room? You know, it's just like, it's just these unquestioned things. And also student work. You know, Lakeshore has taken over the world. And it's like, where's the student work? And you know, I'm not. I'm not talking about um, you know, like the perfect spelling test or the perfect picture, but rather, what's in process? Going back to that growth mindset. I was in a kindergarten classroom about a year ago, and you know, many of you you do this. You draw the in the beginning of school, they draw their portrait. So she had them do that, and then you know, and they were you know, was, and had them you know write or dictate some kind of sentence about themselves. But then she started doing it every month, and she pinned each picture right on top. And it was just this magnificent view of fine motor change, identity change, as they started using different colors to describe themselves, their sentences, whether all of a sudden it wasn't the teacher's writing, but their writing. It's just a, a wonderful display. And you know, so nice for parents to see, so nice for me to see, great for the kids to look back on their growth. Um, and particularly, and you know, I know in Nebraska we have a lot of white kids. And I think particularly our world is in a very, very difficult place right now. 
around diversity. It's really, really, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. And so even if you have a whole school, a whole classroom full of white kids, that again, the responsibility of school is to broaden their viewpoints, is to make sure that they are going to be better able to handle the world than some of the people who are handling it for us right now. No opinion there. Um, <laughs> so a culture of competence, as we said, was one where we're just trying to make sure that kids are productive. And as you know, today is all about voice. Um, and so we started gathering EdgeSnap data 25 years ago. And um, what we saw was this need for silence and compliance in the classrooms. We were seeing across the nation, we were in 11 different states, and we were seeing an average in a six and a half hour day of 28 minutes of meaningful conversation between teachers and kids. And it's like, if you don't have a voice in this world, where are you gonna get? If you're not a person who has confidence and can stand up and can say what they believe in and be able to listen to the voices of others, I don't know where you're gonna get in this world. Again, responsibility on your shoulders. How do we develop voice? And all my wonderful colleagues here are gonna really help you with that today. Um, I've already talked about the vocabulary. And oral language and vocabulary development are two of the main predictors of school, of school success for kids. Major, 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 has to happen. So it has to happen for all those reasons, so I've already talked about a lot of that. We also, and this is about that piece, that collectivism piece, of interacting with others. And you know, um, Common Core is, is controversial. People like it, people don't like it. I love it. And I love it because it really pushed on collaboration, problem solving, play. And I know there's stuff that's not great about it, but I think that it finally recognized that kids are smart and that teachers are smart and that let's, you know, let's use everybody. So the collaboration and interaction is huge. We're used to an instructional model that's made up of a focus lesson. We're gonna get, as a teacher, you're gonna give some information, you're gonna talk about what you think is important, and then you're gonna move back and forth, probably in a whole group, small group setting, you know, doing some practice together, and then they're gonna do it on their own. And that's just pretty much, you know, a very typical way of interacting. Well, the gradual release model adds another step. And it's like after you've sort of, you know, worked with the kids and made sure that they have some kind of basic understanding is let them do it together. Because that's when they start listening to each other, seeing each other's strategies, um, and having that opportunity to actually work together. So um, the, the gradual release model, I think, is really important to, um, to the kinds of things we've been talking about today. Also, um, the strength-based, one of the strength-based, because that's what I've been talking about, um, approach, and this comes from, um, from one of the people who've been here, um, Iomi Aruka, this is, uh, she's part of the Buffett Institute for a long time, and this is some of her research. But to really look at the oral narrative skills, particularly of our African-American kids, so um, if you look at the legacy of African Americans in the United States, we know literally that you could be killed for learning to read or write. You could lose your life for that. So being able to tell stories and being able to make sure that family stories, family history, community history lasted, you had to tell stories. And so it's very powerful in the backgrounds of our African-American kids. 
And so um, um, Boston Public Schools uh, really took this to heart. And they actually, in their kindergarten and first grade curriculums, ask for a half an hour of storytelling every day. It's part of the curriculum. And really, there's get on their websites. There's wonderful videos of it. it it's quite it's quite good. Of uh, you're seeing kids narrate their stories to teachers of them, and just really honoring every word that they say. Not trying to change their words or make them better, um, but just really listening to the story, getting to act it out with their friends. It's such an honoring, and we really and this really does have to do with African American kids, but we really are seeing that it has made a difference in their third grade test scores. And everybody likes to tell stories anyway. So we think about student voice in a, in a couple of different ways. And one is the oral language, which is the, this is more EDGESNAP data. Um, so is meaningful conversation between children and adults and collaboration, which is meaningful conversation between children. And so these are just two examples of classrooms that I've talked to recently. And those are some very, very, very different experiences that kids have. So you have 49% of the day or 196 minutes devoted to student voice, or you have um, 18, 36, 72 minutes a day, I'm multiplying by every percent by four, which gives us the minutes. Um, 72, oh, I even wrote it down. Um, 72 minutes devoted for student voice. Kids have a very different sense of themselves. Teachers have a very different sense of who those kids are, who knows their kids, who, you know, who doesn't know their kids or doesn't know as much as they need to know. So how do you really think about the importance of those ways of interacting? So we talked about self-regulation, which is sort of that emotional piece and that being able to control yourself so that you can really you know, function successfully in a classroom. But the other part of that is, is more of the cognitive part, more of the planning and organizing and being able to tolerate the perspectives of others and to really know that that everybody has needs and they need to be organized. So again, how do you set up your curriculum to include this? To me, executive function and self-regulation needs to be part of the daily plan, like it's something you do every day. You cannot neglect that prefrontal cortex and expect to get the kinds of kids that we want to get. Metacognition is just a, another form of higher order thinking, but it's one that, that, we, that we talk to teachers about a lot because it is that opportunity for kids to explain how they figured things out, why they did what they did, give the evidence or the justification. And you know, we talk to you know, pre-K teachers about this and you know, in K and one, and you know, they start doing it. And you know, typical responses are, if you ask them, well, how did you figure that out? How did you know that? Why did you do that? Is often they will shrug. Um, often they will say, I knew it in my brain. And so they definitely need the practice, but teachers can start by modeling it and say, you know how I knew it? You know how I figured that out? And so for kids to really start at a very young age, to start being able to really think about their thinking is really important. And, and teachers um, often really enjoy this. I had a kindergarten teacher who he was he really wanted to, you know, really do this in his classroom. And he told me after working on it for a year, he said, now, um, if I don't ask them, they'll say, don't you want to know how I figured that out? <laughs> so part of, not part of, um, we help teachers think a lot about their teaching approaches. And like this whole time, I've just been talking at you you know, not 
a great way to convey information. I don't know what you've heard. I don't know what you think. I don't know in what ways I've confused you, lost you, made you mad, made you feel validated. I got, I got nothing. I know nothing. I, you know, I can read faces to some degree, but you know, it's not telling me much because all I'm doing is talking at you. Fortunately, we'll go to breakout groups and change that. So that's didactic teaching. And scaffolds, of course, is the interactive of asking you questions, seeing that you're confused, finding out what you know, asking for input from you. And so, you know, these again, two graphs that I've run into, again, extremely different places for kids to be. And so if I'm talking to the teacher with the graph on the left with 42% of her day, you know, it's like over 160 minutes of talking at young kids um, and doing a lot of isolated skill building. And, I'll, you know, and, and we talk about, you know, some real benefits. It's not that you can't have that. Kids need to, they need to practice things. They need to know rules. They, you, you know, they, you just need to have order going on in the classroom. But I'll say to them, and it's exactly what I would say here, is how do you know what they heard? And so we're always looking for something that's more balanced, which uh, the other one is, where, te where kids are really getting both. So, you know, the research behind that is, um, unfortunately, while the amount of information imparted is greatest when teachers lean heavily on didactic teaching, retention is not. And I think that's sort of the point. As you go forth in your day, I want you to think about, these are some of the things I've sort of thrown on the table for you, is in order to really honor the kids, the families, the communities, is how do, what are you doing to ensure a climate of collaborative inquiry and growth mindset, ensure that children are independent and collaborative learners, ensure that children's voices are honored and valued, and to smooth transitions big and small. So I thank you for your attention. I hope you have a really great rest of the day.